message for me. And uh, I thank the Lord for his revelation. And I thank the Lord if he can inspire you also, if you can see an aspect that, that I didn't see. So please feel free to add. So the teaching is breaking the yokes of Bashan. The difference with what I did on Thursday is uh, it allowed me to put more my idea together. So let's start by reading Psalm 22. So Holy, if you can help me with your Bible, you go to Psalm 22. Sure. Psalm mm -hmm. Thank you. Psalm 22. Mm -hmm. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why hast thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou, that inhabits the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh, laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me around. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue cleaveth to the, my jaws. Thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them. They cast lots upon my vesture. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. Amen. You can go continue. Um, Amen. Oh, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation. Will I praise thee? Continue oh. all the way to 31st. Okay. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither had he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nation shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he is the governor among the nations. All they that be fat upon earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow down before him. And none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he had done this. Amen, amen, amen. And let me throw that to you. When you read all of this first, what is it bringing to your remembrance? When you Jesus. read, exactly. Jesus it, on the cross. Yes. On the cross. Psalm, yes, Psalm 22 is relating you directly to, the, to the, the agony of Jesus on the cross. He's telling you about the hands that are peace, the feet that are peace, how they are around him. And he's comparing them to uh, the bulls of Bashan. He's comparing them to dogs. He's comparing them to lions because 
Jesus on the cross actually was, was, was seeing the entities. That means all of the demons that were driving people in order for him to be dead. So it's, it's amazing. So now we will go back and focus on that word, Bashan, because the revelation that was given me was breaking the, the yokes of Bashan. So I was wondering, what is Bashan? So we will go step by step. Amen. And thank you for joining. And let's go to Bashan. So where is Bashan? I tried to put you a map there. When you look at the map of Israel, Bashan is actually uh, close to Syria now in the actual time. But it was the land on that time just before Can Canaan. And Canaan land was the promised land. Remember when Moses get out and he has to go to the promised land? He has to go to Canaan. And uh, before Canaan, you have that little land that was given to, I think, to Manasseh and uh, to the tribe of Dan, I think so. And it was Bashan. And Bashan was recognized by, uh, there was a lot of um, the things there, like uh, the, 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 the fruit, the, 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 the cattle, they were very impressive because they were very healthy. But at the same time, you find out Bashan was considered like the molten of the gods. Why? Because Bashan has a lot of giants. And uh, Holy, you can read number 2133. It's on the screen. And uh, you can read it. Okay. Then they turned and went up by the way to Bashan. And Og, the king of Bashan, came out against them, he and all his people, to battle at Edri. Uh -huh. Bashan. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Bashan okay. is a location, like I say, is known for Syria in this day. It was a piece of land given to Israel before entering to Jericho. So Bashan has two major places. And I want you to remember these two major places when we will be reading the, the teaching. The first one is Mount Hermon, and the second one is Caesarea Philippi. But we get there slowly and you will understand why we are studying that. So, uh, and you can read in, um, uh, you can read the bad report that the spy gave when they went to the land in order for them to check how they can access Jericho. Holy, can you read is number 13 from 32 to 33. The land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak who came from Nephilim. And we seemed to out, we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers. And so we seemed to them. Amen. So as you see, what the spies saw was not their imagination. They saw people when they went to spy, people eating people. That was the first thing they find. And two, they found out they were descendants from the Nephilim. And the Nephilim were the giants. The Nephilim were the giants. And I think we will read it in the next slide. They were the son of God, that means the fallen angel, that met the, the daughter of men and that created that race of giants. And Goliath was a Nephilim. He was a giant. But you would think that with the flood, all of these people were exterminated. But no, some of them survived and they were living in Bashan. So let's continue and you will see who was Og because they are talking about Og the king. Okay? So who was King Og and what does he represent? The first entity is King Og. Is we are learning about him. And can you read Deuteronomy 3.11 to give you uh, an image of who was Og? Go ahead, please. For only Og, the king of Bashan, we left of the remnant of Rephaim. Behold, his bed was a bed of iron. 
is it not in Rabbah of on the Imanites? Nine cubits was its length and four cubits its breadth, according to the common cubit. Amen. Here they give you just details for you to check who were there and how big they were there. First King Hoog, he was huge. He has a bed that has 13 feet. He was a huge man and he was a king of that land. And King Od was also a remnant of Rephaim. And Rephaim is what? When you study, you found out that the Rephaim were the giant. Like I said, they were the one. Uh, the, uh, no, Rephaim mean the land of dead. So they're the one that they were thinking that were dead, that were living. So Rephaim mean a little bit like living dead is actually the underworld. So, uh, and the, um, I explained here that Og was interesting because we can see how big he was, how huge he was. And we see also that when you read the Bible, you see that Moses has to confront the king of Og. Actually, the law commanded him to get rid of the king of Og and uh, another king called Sihon, S-I-H-O-N. Why we need all of this? Because we need to understand that that entity cross over generation. Because when you have a spirit, uh, a person who is incarnated by a body, but that spirit um, is used by the enemy, the spirit can cross generation and have a certain influence if it's in on the territory. So I'm continuing, okay? So he was, Og was an Amorite by birth and he was the king of Bashan. And you can read it in several. You have Deuteronomy 3, 8. You have Amos 2, 9. He lived in the city called Ashtarosh and Edri. And he had a kingdom that reigned over 60 cities. It was not just one city, 60 cities. And each city had walls and a gate. You see the way Jericho has wall. They tell you the, the gate of Jericho was so huge that you can build a house because the house of Rahab was inside the, inside the wall. You can build a house in the wall. And the gate is so big that, and they are telling you that nobody can get out, nobody can get, come in. So is they were building that strong, um, like strongholds for people not to escape, okay? So, uh, and what else we are learning is, we say Og was a remnant of Rephaim. And what, who are the Rephaim? The Rephaim are the dead. So he was a king of the land of the dead. And we have that uh, explanation. You go to Proverbs 9, 18. Proverbs 9, 18 say, but they do not know that the shade, that means Rephaim are there, that her guests are in the depth of Sheol. So we are talking about the king of an underworld. But why we are talking about that during this season, during the time where we are about to uh, uh, claim the resurrection of Christ and everything, it has a meaning. It has a meaning. So let's go to the next slide and you will see why we are studying that. Because Psalm 22, remember, it reminds you Jesus and he say. I'm seeing the bull of Bashan encompassing me, like uh, surrounding me, okay? So, it's uh, Psalm 22, 12. Many bulls encompass me. Uh, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouth at me like a ravening and roaring lion, okay? First place we will go, and this I'm doing the contrary of what I did on Thursday. Let's go to the place called Caesarea Philippi. The place he lived, Caesarea Philippi was in the time of Jesus. It was in Bashan. And what was happening there? This site has a spring in northern Israel where Jesus took his disciple to reveal the entity as the Messiah. But this is why he took. Caesarea Philippi was also in the land of Bashan. 
It was where Herod built a temple to the God called Pan. And when you study the God Pan in the, in the history is a God who was half a goat. He has a head of a goat, like the ear of a goat and everything. He was half a goat, half a human. And the worship of Pan uh, polluted the whole area because they were doing a lot of abomination. They were doing human sacrifice. They were doing a lot of uh, sexual impudicity, sexual um, sacrifice. When I say sexual, they were having sex and giving. It was like an offering to uh, the God. And they were doing mixing animals and humans. So it was an abomination. And uh, Erod Philip rebuilt the city and named it after himself. But Caesarea Philippi continued to focus on worship of Greek gods. This is in Israel. This is in the time of Jesus that those things were happening. So Jesus chose to announce who he was to his disciple as Caesarea Philippi. In that pagan setting, he encouraged his disciple to build a church. And we will go there. If you can open your Bible, in Matthew 16, uh, uh, Holy, you go to Matthew 16, and we go to the story where uh, Jesus is asking who they say I am. I think it's 1613. Okay. Um, Peter's confession of faith. Um, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barhona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my father, which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. So I gave you an image there of where was uh, happening all of this worship. It was these caves where they usually come and there was a spring coming out of this cave and that spring usually go all the way to the Jordan River. But in this cave, they usually slaughter animals. Sometimes they go all the way to human sacrifice and push the body inside, you understand? And at the entrance of this cave, you can see the God Pan, the statue of the God Pan. This is where everything was happening. But why Jesus chose that site? Because normally the, uh, the, the priests at the synagogue knew that this place is cursed. They cannot step there because that is where most of the, 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 the power of those king, like Herod and everything, were coming from the worship of those idols. So they couldn't step there because for them it was not holy. But this is the very place where Jesus come and challenge his disciples and ask them, who do you say no, no, I what am? I, no, what are you saying here? Go ahead. Someone was speaking. Amen. So he said, who do you say I am? And when Peter answered and he Turn around to Peter and he say, you are Peter. And on this rock, on this rock, look at the rock behind. On this rock, the very same place, the very same place where they have a, a dollar tree. The gate of head should not prevail. He was telling those forces. He was talking to the place. He was talking to the environment. He was talking also to those people who were taking power from those, that the gate of Hades, 
whatever you are doing in this underworld, whatever you are doing in darkness, whatever you are doing in the land of death, you will not prevail on my church. The power of darkness will not prevail. So that was the first. And he made the Holy Spirit talk to Peter to say he is the son of God. He is the Messiah. He decided to announce there to cancel the power already of those uh, adults. So, and I explained here that the gate, uh, uh, the most of the time, people think perhaps that um, some things you shouldn't touch because you're afraid of the warfare you will bring. But actually, Jesus went there to say, it was another way to say that, those idols or whatever power that is standing in front of you, you can confront it with his name because it's true victory that you are fighting. He went to the very place where they were doing idolatry to declare, I am the son of God. I am the Messiah and your power cannot be over mine because he's the king of kings. Hallelujah. And I say gate were defensive structure in the ancient world by saying that the gate of hell will not overcome. Jesus suggests that those gates were going to be attacked. Understand that the gate of the enemy can be attacked. No matter how strong is an entity, no matter how strong hold you can see in a town or in a city, the gate can be attacked because if you carry church, if you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, you can stand and say, I live by the faith of Jesus and I declare and I judge those power. Amen. So standing as they were as literal gate of Hades, the disciple may have been overwhelmed by Jesus' challenge. They had studied under the rabbi for several years and now he was commissioning them to a huge task to attack evil and to build the church on the very places that were filled with moral corruption. This is why he went there. Wherever there's darkness, you can bring light because the gate of Hades will not prevail where there is light. Jesus pretended a clear challenge, presented a clear challenge with his word at Caesarea Philippi. He didn't want his followers hiding from evil because a lot of people are afraid of evil, they will hide from evil. He wants them to storm the gate of hell. He wants them to storm the gate of hell. So let's go to the second place where he went to declare his name. That was in Bashan as well. That was in Bashan as well. Here we go. We are going to Mount Ammon. Hallelujah. So we know already that Bashan represents the presence of darkness and the land of death. Now, Jesus chose most of the Bible we tell you he went to a high hill. But a lot of scholars say he went to the Mount Ammon. Mount Ammon also has the same story of idolatry. Mount Ammon was also a place where there were a lot of idolatry happening. So Jesus went and Matthew 70, 17. Can you uh, read Matthew? Actually, it's not 17, 17. It's 17 from 1 to 5. Can you read it for us, please? Sure. Um... Jesus took the disciples in the darkest place to defeat the forces of darkness. He went to show them the greater light. He visited Bashan to destroy the, to destroy the forces of darkness. Um, and after his... Go ahead, dear, please. Six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light and behold there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him and Peter said to Jesus Lord it is good that we are here if you wish I will make three tents here one for you one for Moses and one for Elijah he was still speaking when behold a bright cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the cloud said this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased listen to him Amen. Amen. And from 
I, I found out from the event at Caesarea Philippi to this event at Mount Hermon, there were six days. Six days after he bring his disciple, the two of them on the mountain to pray. And then there, he's, he take his spiritual appearance. He became so shiny. And now two other, Moses and Elijah, next to him. Why he chose to do that just on Mon Ammon, just on Bashan, because he wants to, to defeat the forces of darkness. He wanted to say, I am the greater light. No matter what, no matter how darkness is dark, if I can say, I am bigger than darkness. What message is he sending to us? He's sending to us across generation that no matter the, the abomination of the land, no matter what is happening, we are born sometimes from family where there's no word to describe what they did in the family. And we can see only the result. We came and there's only ruins. And we discovered that, oh my God, how will I start doing this? The family is divided. Nobody is speaking to each other. The children have some have problems, some are mental, some are. So you don't even know where to start. But the Lord say, is in that very place where there's darkness, is that very place where there's nothing to comprehend that you can call on his light. And he say, you are the light of the world. That means is in that very place that his light can come. That is what he did before going to the cross. And now when he's on the cross and he's seeing all of these, like he said, the bull of Bashan and all of these people coming, crucify him, crucify him, going after him, going and insulting him. And he was beaten and he was peace and feet and legs. He still see them. They still think they have the last word. They still think, think they are the one who will win. But this is where the very victory of Jesus came, when his blood was shed, when his blood was shed. And when he was able to go, because I tried to see if I could add 1 Peter 4, uh, 6. You can find it in your Bible. You have 1 Peter 4, 6, and you have Ephesians 2, 6. 1 Peter 4, 6. If you can find it. Holly, can you read? Mm -hmm, yep. Go ahead. First Peter 4, 6. For, mm -hmm. for, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Amen. Go ahead. Um, uh, how long do I keep reading? What? No, normally it's First Peter 4, 6 to say, when he was at the cross, because these operations are two, I'm trying to show you that after, when he was at the cross, when he, he was uh, crucified, then he went low. That is Ephesians 2, 6. He went to the other world and he took the keys of Hades and hell. Amen? And uh, the, the passage you just read is saying that he went to preach to the dead. Can you read it again? Read like 5 to 7. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they may be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Amen. When you read it, you understand that actually, because he need to help also, the one who were dead before he appeared, the one who were dead on the time of Moses, the one who were dead on the time of Abraham because they didn't know him in the spirit. He has to go and preach to them. Amen. And also he took the key. That means death 
and uh, death and hell. He has the key. And you have that in Revelation 1.17. I'm trying to put the both together. But I, when I was trying to add it to my, my presentation, the Lord say, the Holy Spirit said, no. Preach about Bashan. That other part happened when he was crucified. So I'm talking about Bashan only, only because Bashan happened when he was still living. He went to declare to darkness, the gate of hell will not prevail. Darkness is on this world now. We have seen so many things. Just of on phone, when you go on YouTube, you see things that are abomination, abomination. But guess what? We can claim still that the resurrection will not be, that Passover will not just be a day where we are happy, Jesus, he died on the cross for us. But we understand that that light that shone that day, that veil that was uh, torn that day, it was for the light that is inside you to be revealed as well. For we have, we have, we have the mandate to bring that light out. We have the mandate to say to darkness, you stop here because Jesus lives in me and I will not allow darkness to reign where I am. And we can see what happened. What are the lessons of breaking the yoke of Bashan? We have that in Colossians 2.15 and I can read it. He said, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. He went to those places to disarm the, 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 the rulers and authority, to disarm the power of darkness. Hallelujah. And I add, no matter the evil standing on your way, Jesus conquered death and his principality. The gates of hell should not prevail. There is a show that Jesus has started when he started destroying the, those powers. And we are continuing the show as we are telling those power, you cannot prevail in the life, not only of Christian, but of brother and sister with stretch of faith, with stretch of or, or, or shield of faith. And we say, you will not prevail on the life of our children. You will not prevail in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We will continue to claim the power of the blood all the way to the resurrection. Anytime, anywhere you have darkness in front of you, I'm here to tell you, don't be afraid because Jesus has won the power over darkness. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 So Amen. I open up for prayer before we go to, um, to uh, I, I open up for question before we go to prayer, please. Is there this any question? such an exciting lesson like that? I've always loved that Psalm 22, but that you expanded that that was all done on purpose. Like everything he does is, is on purpose. You know, the place yes. we proclaim that it's so powerful. That's so powerful. Yes. yes. Thanks for sharing this. This is just so key. A man, a man. Yes. And it's amazing that all of this year, we, I just do Easter, Passover and all of the rest. But I've never seen, when he told me breaking the yoke of Bashan, I say, I've never heard about Bashan. It's more than 14 years that I've been teaching. It's amazing. Lord, what do you want to tell me? And when I start reading, I say, oh my God. He confronted darkness. But the, the disciple couldn't understand. It's why they couldn't. They just wrote that he just transfigured. Why he would transfigure in the land that everybody know that they come and do all type of idolatry. Why we choose that to transfigure? Why he didn't go to the synagogue to transfigure? Why he did not transfigure when he was on, in, on, on the, in the river of Jordan being baptized? He was not there to convince the disciple that I am your Messiah. No, he was speaking to darkness. He was speaking to darkness and telling darkness, I am the greater light. And where there's light, there's no darkness. Amen. Wow. Amen. Amen. So, um, Amen. It's... Go ahead, Mama. So when you were teaching, mm -hmm. when you were talking about the bull of Bashan, mm -hmm. I 
just the, the Holy Spirit just download and remind me a dream. Uh -huh. I had that dream seven, many times, uh, like two or three times, where they were, where uh, cow were mm -hmm. chasing me, were chasing me. Wow. So, yes. So, uh, those are uh, is like telling me that that's where they drag their power from. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. This yes. is I... why we we do the teaching and then we pray because mm -hmm. the those bulls that come you have cow chasing you or darkness that come like uh, and I was explaining to Mr. Pauline yesterday that when I went to the three days of uh, without knowing where I was, I was like in a type of coma and I came back. Something weird were happening to me for two or three days before my brain starts functioning very well is uh, when I go to sleep, I have clip very short moment where everything turned gray, completely gray. I cannot see colors anymore. And I'm in that aspect where everything turned gray and not only gray is, I hear scream. And then the color come back and I say, Lord, what is it? And he told me, is death. Is death, actually. Not that death was threatening me, but he was showing me like when someone is on the other side, what he perceives. You see, we don't appreciate enough life. We think life is granted, we go up and down. But life is a gift. When you are on the other side, there's nothing <clears throat> else you can do. There's nothing else you can do. But on this side, on where you have life and Christ is in you, you have total victory. Because even death, your spirit continues to live. This is why he has to visit the dead. He has to visit the dead in order to impact those who accept him with, his, with eternal life. So that even dead, the spirit can be alive. Amen. 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 So is there any other question before we start praying? So uh, my my question is if the maybe next time if the Holy Spirit allow us to 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 get the kind of prayer to pray against the power of Bashan. Yeah, I put them there. I put the prayers like you you. Those are the ones we did yesterday. But okay. we will do on Thursday again. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Let's start by pleading the blood. Pleading the blood, everyone. The blood of Jesus. 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 The blood of Jesus.